All right, well, hello, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Dr. Wallace, and I'm the Charging uh, Center Training Director. I think you all know the Charging Center is our university center for excellence in developmental disabilities. And on behalf of the Charging Center and our co-sponsors, which include the Center for Autism Research and Treatment, CART, and also the IDDRC, which is our Professional Developmental Disabilities Research Center. I want to welcome you guys to our February lecture. It's my pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Nicole McDonald. Um, I'm sure many of you already know much about Dr. McDonald, but I'm going to give you a little background about her um, accomplishments. She is a clinical instructor here at the, um, in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the David Geffen School of Medicine. CLA. She's a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in the early identification of autism spectrum disorder. Um, as an attending psychologist at the UCLA Child and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic, also known as the CAN Clinic, um, she conducts ASD-focused evaluations primarily in young children and family-based treatment um, of behavior problems in preschool-aged children um, using PCIT, parent-child interaction therapy, um, and she oversees the clinical practicum program in the CAN Clinic. Um, Dr. McDonald's research interests integrate brain-based brain um, and naturalistic behavioral methods to study early social and emotional development in infants with elevated risk for autism. She is a member of the Baby Sibs Research Consortium with much of her past research focusing on infants and um, familiar risk um, in autism and more recently in children with genetic conditions. Um, including T TSC. Um, currently, she has a K-23 mm -hmm. award um, from the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development to longitudinally study uh, early brain and social development in high-risk infants who experienced extended NICU hospitalizations. Um, Dr. McDonald's uh, eventual goal with this research is to apply the information gained from these longitudinal studies and clinical experiences to develop family-based interventions uh, to improve early social development in uh, infant risk um, youth that have high risk for autism in infancy. Um, Dr. McDonald today is going to be presenting, I'm sure it will be a very interesting lecture, on um, autism in early childhood, signs and first diagnosis. So please join me in welcoming Dr. McDonald. Well, thank you all for being here in the middle of the day. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about one of my favorite topics today, so I'm excited to talk with you. Feel free if you guys have questions throughout to just kind of chime in, that's fine, and hopefully we should have some time at the end as well to discuss any of the topics that I bring up. Um, so some of the things I wanted to kind of make sure we covered and get across today include, I'm gonna talk about some of the literature on high-risk infants. This is really gonna be focused on the younger siblings of children with autism or familial risk infants, because that's where most of what we know comes from at this point. Um, and I'm gonna be focusing more on the kind of bigger studies that have been done. There's been like hundreds of research studies. So there's a lot to know, but sort of what do we know um, that we can kind of really, really trust at this point? Um, after going through that, I'll talk about um, the early emergence of autism, so what are some kind of like early signs, red flags, things to pay attention to in the first couple of years of life um, that might signal that this child is um, developing autism. Um, and then talking about that in relation to, well, what would we expect in typical development? Um, and that's my chance to kind of put some, you know, kind of videos of my own child um, in there. And, um, and then I'll be going through kind of the um, evaluation process so kind of what I typically do so in the can clinic here um, with children who are under three who are coming in with some concern for autism so kind of from the beginning to the end and on with some resources as well that may be helpful um, so in terms of the high-risk infant research, um, gosh, it's maybe like kind of almost 20 years ago now, um, some researchers started coming together to try to solve this problem that seems like there are things going on in the first couple of years of life that signal concern at least to parents that their child may be developing atypically, that something different may be going on. Um, particularly in the social domain or unusual behaviors. Um, but, you know, kind of it actually still remains that children are not typically being diagnosed with autism until later in development. And sometimes that's appropriate, and oftentimes we could actually, um, in a perfect world, have caught those kids earlier. Um, and we know that in many cases, so if we identify a child at age two, they're likely to kind of continue meeting criteria for autism spectrum disorder by that time. Um, 
And so to kind of solve this problem, um, some researchers came together to study the children who have a family history of autism and specifically those who have an older sibling with autism. So pretty strong family history. Um, there. Before that, a lot of the work was retrospective, so using kind of videotapes and things or parent report after the fact, but this allowed researchers to look prospectively um, to actually view development in real time. And, you know, I think initially the thought was like, wow, we're really going to kind of be able to see this. Like maybe even within the first year of life, we're going to be able to kind of see as it emerges and it's going to solve all these problems. And as we found out, it has certainly given us some more knowledge, but hasn't illuminated things, I think, in the way that researchers have hoped. So we'll kind of take, the, take some of the big points and talk through what we, what we still don't know. Um, so at this point, we have the Baby Siblings Research Consortium, or BSRC, which is a bunch of researchers, um, including some of us here at UCLA, who've, um, who've studied these babies for, for some time. And um, they've put together um, a database um, where you can look at just hundreds and hundreds of kids. Because each of these studies, it's like 100 kids, and maybe you have you know, kind of 10 with ASD. So there's a limited amount that you can learn from that. So this has allowed us to kind of ask bigger questions that we can more robustly answer. So those, that's the research I'll focus on today. Um, so one of the first questions that the BSRC sought to answer, led by um, Dr. Ozanoff at UC Davis, um, is just what's the kind of simple recurrence risk? Um, their overall number actually was higher, and there may be various reasons for that, but then kind of just epidemiological studies that have occurred in different settings. Um, so these are, again, kind of looking at all younger siblings, and their outcome age that they looked at was age three where you can really kind of capture almost all kids um, with, with a good amount of reliability and validity at that age. Um, so it was almost 20% that has been found, and that's been pretty consistent. It ranges, of course, differently by site, um, by research site, um, but you know, kind of as further studies have come out, that seems to be a number that seems about right for these studies. That may be higher than the normal population in that there may be kind of something different about the families who sign up for these studies. Um, and and we're also kind of, you know, I think um, really looking in detail and you have experts being able to kind of capture maybe subtler presentations of autism as well. Um, so as you would expect, there um, is a higher likelihood of autism in, um, in males versus females. So the rate that they find is somewhere around three to one. So slightly different than some of the rates that, you know, kind of that four to one number that we hear. Um, so that's been fairly consistent across studies. Um, and in this study, they didn't find anything with the older sibling, um, gender, IQ, when that was available, severity of autism symptoms, or um, demographics of the family that predicted an ASD outcome. Um, so I think the take home point here is just kind of validating that um, these infants, you know, kind of should be, should be followed extra closely, like by their pediatricians, by their parents, and um, there should be kind of in maybe an easier road to early intervention for these kiddos. Um, then we have, um, so this is a study that um, Dr. Shafali Jeste and I led recently using BSRC data that looked specifically at multiplex risk. So these are kiddos um, where we specifically identified those who have um, at least two older siblings with an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. So if you just have one older sibling, um, you may have some genetic risk, or you may not, depending on the type of autism that we're talking about and where that comes from. But we know if there's kind of more than one family member with that, there is, you know, maybe kind of a different genetic profile. Um, and so we wanted to kind of single out these kids, and we compared them with children who um, who had an older sibling with autism and at least one older sibling who did not have autism um, to kind of sort of spread apart the groups a little bit. And we asked several things, including about developmental trajectories, which I won't get into today. But I think one of the, one of the main things to show is that, 
you know, this is not one homogenous group. When you break it apart, you can see that the rates are pretty different. So when we know there's a strong family history um, for this multiplex group of children, about a third or slightly over a third of them at age three met criteria for an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. So a pretty large proportion. Um, and that was different than in the single incidence group, as you can see. Um, the atypical group um, actually didn't differ, but when you kind of look at both of those together, you can see just about a third of the multiplex children were considered kind of typically developing at age three, and how we defined that was there weren't any kind of developmental delays that were, um, that were shown or any kind of measurable subclinical ASD symptoms, although there could have been things that weren't measured by the ADOS. Um, so that you know, kind of proportion was pretty different. So that puts some extra context that even the take home is similar, but really, you know, kind of if you have a strong family history, um, we know that these children, you know, kind of a good proportion will, you know, kind of go on to typical development and, and not have any concerns, but a quite large proportion may need some support um, and early intervention early on, and so. We don't have a lot to kind of sort of, of preventive interventions, but really um, they should be monitored pretty closely. It was actually hard to differentiate those, harder to differentiate those earlier on um, who went on to ASD um, versus kind of other types of outcomes. Harder in the multiplex children than the, than the single incidence families. Um, so really kind of watching them closely and getting them support as soon as it comes up is sort of the idea. Um, and what I'd really like is if there were just kind of easier roads for those families, because often families, um, as you guys may know, if you work in this area, have to kind of, the kids basically have to be delayed a certain amount or have to be a certain age and showing like really clear autism symptoms. And some places are starting to allow infant siblings kind of some easier access. And that would be nice just because we know, again, that they're more likely to have these needs and outcomes. Um, so in terms of diagnostic stability, there was also kind of some, a focus on there. I think some of the interesting things that come out of this that I really use in my clinical work a lot to think about it is we can identify kids reliably as early as 18 months, but we're not catching everyone. So that's kind of really one of the important things. So if, I, if, if an expert person who really knows what they're looking for identifies a child at 18 months, they're pretty likely to continue on um, that road and continue to have needs related to autism spectrum disorder. But we're missing some kids. As you can imagine, a clinician at 18 months, you're going to be kind of conservative um, and not you know, kind of throwing out a label too easily. So it may be a higher level of need. And I think some of the kids just aren't showing clear enough symptoms in many cases. Um, so really what changed over time is we kind of captured more kids. Um, and some kids between ages two and three are really showing um, an increase in symptomatology. Often those kids that are not getting identified until later are those, as you might imagine, who aren't showing the same level of delay. So maybe their kind of general development is progressing pretty typically um, and where they have certain social strengths or they just you know, kind of aren't showing those social deficits that you might expect in autism. And sometimes you might also see an increase in repetitive behavior. So I think that's important to keep in mind. So when I'm talking to families, I think about this a lot. Like if I see a 12 to 18 month old and they, you know, kind of, I'm not concerned about it, them at that time. I'm careful to not sort of over reassure a family, especially if there's some known kind of um, risk factor like family history um, where then like they look great now and I'm not concerned, but it really we should continue to monitor um, screen again at age two, age three, um, because there could be some needs that arise later in development which is not fun for families to hear, but is better than <laughs> over reassurance. Um, and then I'll just kind of quickly go through the broader autism phenotype or BAP or BAP. Um, so kind of the idea that um, there may be kind of some subclinical symptoms or other attributes that you may see in other family members. So this, the kind of main point in some of these studies are that about 20%, it depends how you define it, um, fell into groups. And these are the kids who didn't have ASD outcomes, um, but had a family history, um, fell into groups with either 
Developmental scores um, using the Mullen or um, higher ADOS scores. So that's um, may or may not have exceeded the threshold, um, but kind of higher than you would expect there. So then this is really just signaling. One, I think clinically, one of the things I think about, so if I'm seeing a family where there is a family history of autism, um, obviously, you know, there's a higher likelihood that that child um, could meet criteria, but also there's a higher likelihood that that child may show a couple of symptoms and I have sort of an explanation that it may just be kind of some broader autism phenotype, but they're really not impaired or showing the full kind of clinical presentation. It may be that they have other needs in other areas, but that a diagnosis isn't appropriate um, for them at that time. So it's kind of an explanation that you know, kind of other children who are clinically referred, I might be struggling to get at. Um, so some things that we don't know from the literature um, or that kind of we've found more generally in some, some missing pieces. So uh, as with a lot of our research, um, a lot of these studies, it varies some by research site, are not very representative samples. So it's definitely um, a lot of highly educated, at least college educated or even above families, um, mostly white families. Um, again, that kind of varies by site. I worked at Miami a lot and we had a higher Latino population and stuff, so it varies, but that's generally, it's about kind of like 20% there's some diversity. And so we definitely need to be doing a better job of getting the full population of families and children um, who are affected by autism. Um, and in terms of behavior, so we kind of, again, there was that idea that maybe in that first year of life, we, if we just saw it, we would be able to tell which kids. Like there's this idea that you would see autism developing from really early. And if you just kind of had a lens back then, that has not been the case. There certainly are children, at least in my experience on the studies, where you, I have been concerned about them before one year. But in a lot of kids, it's really not until past one year that you can feel kind of confident that um, they're, you know, kind of you could sort of guide the parent to be like, okay, this might be the trajectory that your child's on. So like I'd mentioned, I, I don't over reassure because of that. And then there's also this interesting thing that I've seen and some of the literature has shown where, you know, between 12 and 18 months, 12 to 24 months, there may be at least this kind of mild social regression or kind of pulling back um, from the environment. So that's a story I hear from a lot of families in, who come in clinically and that I've seen some in the, in the um, families that I see for research as well. Um, so I think that's also something that's going on. I mean, some of these babies, like truly, they're you know, kind of looking just like any other baby in the first year of life. And the great thing about that is a lot of the kids in these studies actually, they have a lot of really useful skills um, and a lot of them do develop language. It's mostly for ADOS people, module twos that we're doing at age three. Um, and maybe kind of subtler presentations of autism spectrum disorder because they, they really have a lot of strengths. And part of that might be if this type of autism as it develops, you're getting a lot of social input and interaction in that first year of life. That's really useful. That doesn't go away even if some symptoms, you know, kind of come on once you're one or two years old. Um, we also need to kind of follow these babies um, longer term. Um, and so a lot of these studies, the bigger studies have ended at age three. I know that some of these kids will then, you know, kind of in often the kind of milder presentation, a lot of these kids will go on um, to maybe kind of have more impairing symptoms as they get into school and preschool age um, and things get harder. Um, so we also, and we also might be interested in kind of comorbid issues and other types of um, concerns that could arise, um, as well as kids, you know, just to see how they're doing. Um, and really need to do a better job applying some of this too. It's been hard to do that, but to be able to kind of screen better. Um, and we've, there's definitely been more work focused on early intervention, so that's definitely on its way. Um, and then with some of the work here that we're focused on is kind of going beyond these familial risk infants. Um, to be able to kind of understand autism and neurodevelopmental disorders as they arise in different backgrounds, not just family history, but genetic disorders. Um, and as Dr. Loggison had mentioned, you know, kind of also looking at kind of early medical risk, things like that, as well as the general population, although that's a tough one. Um, 
So in terms of some early signs to kind of think of the more clinical side of things, early signs of ASD, I mean, you're really looking for early manifestations of the symptoms in a lot of cases in terms of what we can at this point sort of reliably know. So in terms of social interaction, communication, um, a really common one that is luckily kind of really out there is this response to name. So that's kind of one of those at 12 months, if they're not consistently responding to their name, like I'm concerned. Um, so that's kind of a nice, like clear one that you families are usually pretty um, aware of, at least the ones that, that I see um, and that you can kind of test out in the clinic. Um, there's, this is not across the board, but like that bright positive affect, you might see less of that um, in kiddos who are going on to an ASD diagnosis. Um, you may, I mean, eye contact's an amazing thing in that, you know, kind of in typical development, I mean, it's, it develops so early, like within the first six months of life, a child knows where to look, they're making really consistent eye contact before all of these other skills come online. So that's good to pay attention to, but it's kind of subtle too at the same time. Um, and then of course we pay attention to joint attention. Um, usually what gets kids in the clinic is that their language is delayed. The issue is that is not all children who um, are developing autism spectrum disorder have language delays. Um, and that can be kind of various things. It's not a symptom of autism, but honestly that's usually what, what gets them in. Um, but we're also paying attention to kind of how they're communicating elsewhere. Um, repetitive play between one and two, you might see some repetitive behaviors emerging. You just need to be careful because one, if a kid's developmentally delayed, that may be kind of appropriate for their stage of development. Um, also, typically developing kids or kids who are not going on to have an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, um, the hand flap, they may try things out repetitively. They're at 12 months, the kid's gonna be dropping things repetitively from the table, like that's, it's pretty normal. So it's kind of a matter of scale and what's happening over time and isn't happening to the exclusion of other things. So just to be kind of some caution around that. And of course, if there is any kind of developmental regression that is not kind of really typical if that's happening. Um, so that usually parents will, will notice that. So in terms of what is typical, um, we've kind of alluded to some of this here. Um, but yeah, from pretty early in life, like you're, you should have a pretty nice responsive smile by six months of age. So it's not gonna happen in every situation, but if your parent smiles at you, a lot of the time that baby's gonna smile back and it's gonna be really linked in time. So that's something you can pay attention to. Joint attention, meaning, you know, kind of directing someone else's attention, using eye contact, eventually using points, things like that. Um, should start to come online between nine and 12 months. You should also, by like 12 to 18 months, be more consistently following someone else's, you know, kind of point, things like that. Um, language and communication. So again, this is often what brings kids in. Um, you know, kind of, we like to see gestures by 12 months. You know, there should be some type of wave going on, several gestures going on. Um, babbling, you know, kind of happens earlier. So if I have a baby who's kind of really quiet in that first year of life, I'm concerned about that, that they're not kind of, even though I don't expect words yet, that they're not showing those kind of precursors um, that we'd expect. And kind of by 18 months, that's often kind of a time point where, you know, you're seeing the pediatrician and stuff. Um, you know, kind of a common threshold is 10 words that they're using, but that's, it's, it's pretty low. Um, a lot of kids are showing dozens and dozens, using dozens and dozens of words at that point and maybe even putting words together. Um, but that's at least kind of like a number that you kind of, you can use that. By 18 months, kids should be using some single words. Um, and then you may also be paying attention um, to play as well. And I'll show some video there of some cute play in just a minute too. So to just kind of give you some examples um, of my son that I put in all my research studies that I can. Um, so this is him when he's 11 months um, in a study I did at my previous postdoc. Um, these first two are during something called the early social communication scales or ESCS, um, which is kind of more of a research measure that we use to study the emergence of joint attention and early communication. Um, all right, let me see if I can get this playing. Nope. Okay. It's a turn-taking task. 
seeing if you get like early baby conversations, kind of. <laughs> All right, so what are some of the things that you guys saw there in terms of sort of the things you'd be paying attention to around this 11 to 12 month age that you might expect in typical development? Do so I have any things you noticed? Yeah. Right, yeah, so it's kind of coordinated too. It's like eye contact, but then it's like at the right time. It doesn't feel random at this point. Yep, yeah, that's a good observation. Any other? Hmm? Social reciprocity. Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of this back and forth, and that's really what this thing is trying to get at, is this turn-taking, because to be able to later do conversations, like if you go to a peers group and you're trying to learn conversations, what comes before that is the more kind of nonverbal um, way of going back and forth and knowing it's my turn, it's your turn. Um, so that's something that, you know, kind of at this stage that he understood and that you would really expect, you know, kind of a lot of kids, not that they would always show it every time, but that you would expect them to understand that. Um, and I think some of the other things, you know, we're looking at are kind of like affect and stuff that the child seems to be enjoying um, what's going on and clearly letting the, the person know that as well. All right, so this is a quick example of joint attention. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there you can see, and this is kind of, you know, kind of what we're looking for in this, um, is that, you know, kind of he was watching the thing, but then he disengaged his attention, which is not always easy to do. He looked at the examiner and then added in a smile and kind of a little booty shake, um, which is not codable, but you know, it all went together, um, to, to put it together. And maybe there could have been a vocalization too, so there's some coordination there, um, but it's also that kind of shifting attention. Like, it's important enough to me to stop looking at this thing that I like to share this moment with you, and then I'm gonna get more excited about it. Um, so that's an important skill that we look to be happening around this age range. Um, and this is something that I'm particularly interested in is empathy development in response to distress. Um, so I tested out, I pretended to hurt my finger. Let me see, there we go. Ow. Just after a free play. Ow. <laughs> I pretend to think he's kissing it and not eating it, but... <laughs> yeah, and he liked babbling Dada and not Mama at that age, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so like that, that may not happen by 12 months, but you know, kind of even at this early age, may start to, you know, kids may notice if another child is crying, they may just look at them, they may even get a little bit nervous, or they may get to the point where they can kind of look sympathetic or try to help. So over that kind of like 12 months to 24 months, that's another thing that we're paying attention to, and that has differentiating, differentiated kids um, who go on to an autism outcome versus those who don't. Um, and then just here's a, an example of peer play. So this is, I think they're almost three here. Just to show you, and the, some of you may totally know, but like kids from an early age play interactively and you can expect that, especially if they've had the opportunity to have those experiences. I'm going to stop a little early to make sure you have enough time for everything. But what are some of the things that you guys noticed they were doing together? Anything that was notable? They were talking to each other. Yeah, like without any kind of parent support or intervention. I mean, obviously, I'm there recording them. But they were checking in with each other. So it was kind of like looking at like there. And they were just kind of figuring out the situation. They were kind of cooperatively 
planning and coordinating, um, which is pretty complex. So kids are really, you know, kind of at age two or are able to do some of these things. Um, and so, of course, if you have a child coming in who hasn't had those hasn't been in daycare and stuff, you know, you're not dinging them too much for that, but knowing that that's something that children at these early ages are capable of helps us to put into context um, when we see young children who may be having some social difficulties early in life. Oh. Um, okay, so I'm going to kind of jump ahead now um, to going into just some of the details of the assessment process for younger children. Um, and kind of what, what kind of makes up the assessment um, and what are important areas to include. Um, so as I kind of alluded to, so I feel comfortable diagnosing by about 18 months of age. Um, you know, kind of throughout, it's really a separate thing, I think, when you're, when you're clinically um, evaluating kiddos under three. Like, you want to be super, super comfortable with this population, and again, you want to know what's typical at this age, what's sort of the range of typical, and you want to know kind of what autism may look like at these earlier ages. So you want to make sure it's easy to kind of miss some of these things, um, and so that it's someone who specializes in that area and has a lot of experience in that area. Um, so as a lot of this is, is similar, um, but they're kind of almost few things that you're looking at, so it's almost a more condensed thing than when you're um, when you're evaluating an older child. Um, but you always kind of want to, of course, take a good developmental or med and medical history. So you want to be kind of knowing what are risk factors. So is there a family history? Of course, you would want to know that. Um, prenatal factors that may have gone on that either could have increased the likelihood of some type of atypical development, including autism, or may kind of better explain what's going on as well. So you want to be thinking about all of those things. Um, I always like to think about, too, what were the social experiences? If there's an early history of trauma, like if there wasn't, say, it's you know seeing a child from foster care and there wasn't an early attachment figure, it doesn't mean that that child couldn't have autism or that an autism diagnosis at some point may not be appropriate. Um, but that could be a really good explanation for what's going on and you may want to wait and see that if they didn't have those early experiences where, you know, kind of infants are learning how to socialize with someone, usually with that primary attachment figure or figures early on, then that's really important to note when you're making your diagnosis. Um, in terms of, you of course want a direct assessment of ASD symptoms, so you know, kind of as with all cases, you need to ask the parents because you're not going to see everything in your kind of short assessment period that you're working with the child. Um, so that's, in our clinic at least, we usually do the autism diagnostic interview, ADIR, um, which is not actually too long when you're doing it with these younger children, um, but it's sometimes lengthier than, than, you know, kind of some settings can, um, can accommodate. Um, particularly, you're looking for things like repetitive behaviors, how they're doing with other people, other familiar adults, um, asking about peer play and peer experiences, stuff like that. So things that are kind of nonverbal communication, you can tell pretty well, usually during your assessment. Um, but you do want to know, are they, it's like separation anxiety, stranger anxiety can be much more common at this age, so you want to be aware of that and figure out they in more familiar situations in case you don't see a good representative sample of behavior during your assessment. And then of course you want to, you know, kind of do a direct assessment. So of course here we do the ADOS. Um, and at these earlier ages is often the toddler module, which is for those kiddos under three. So it was specifically developed um, for those children to be kind of more appropriate um, for them. And it's pretty fun to do as well. Um, and then you want to be looking at other skills because reg one, these could be a better explanation for what's going on. So if there's a general developmental delay going on and the child is, you know, at a six month level mental age, that may be like, well, I'm not making a call on autism right now um, because that can explain a lot what's going on. That's primarily what we're going to focus on an intervention and that's the diagnosis we're going to make um, but also it's a really important context so we know that our kids you know kind of with autism vary a ton and it's really important to know like where their areas of strength are either relative to typical peers so like 
something that's really above average that really stands out that you're like, we better use this in intervention. And that's just nice for the parents to know. Um, but even relative to themselves as well. So like, you know, kind of in many cases, the child may actually their kind of visual reception. So that early nonverbal problem solving skills may be an area of strength, which is a really important predictor for future development too if it's like a nice careful assessment. So I'm always looking to really get like the best performance out of these kids and I really, really care how that developmental um, test goes um, because it is important just for kind of like forecasting, even though a lot of kids will show lower skills don't exactly know where they're going to go. Um, it's really important context. Um, but it's also important to reflect to the families that it's not the same as IQ. We're looking at a lot of in these early ages, like developmental milestones, which are not like completely unrelated to what we think of later as IQ, but it's, it's just not the same thing. Um, so you're really just going at this point in time, this is where your child is at. And then adaptive skills, again, this is just across development is really important to follow because these are really the skills that are the useful skills that you want someone to be able to learn so that they can live an increasingly independent life. Um, so I always reflect to parents that these are the things to kind of pay attention to. These are often good treatment targets. Um, you may also get kind of a mix of strengths and, and challenges as well. Um, a lot of our kiddos with ASD regardless of what their developmental skills or IQ is at, will show lower skills in this area. Um, so it's an important area to find out about. And then you may or may not kind of, if there are therapists or other people to talk to, that may be helpful, but you may be doing less of that in the younger years. Um, it just depends on the kid's life and they may be with the parents all of the time. So you kind of have all the collateral you're gonna get. Um, Okay, so special considerations for testing. I'll show you a tantrum in just a second. Um, <laughs> so you have to be extra careful. So in general, when you're testing kids, but you have to be extra careful. Like you really have to think about what's a good time of day for the child. Obviously, it's usually morning. When is nap time? Um, you have to pay attention to that um, so that you're not testing them during their nap time because if they're tired, they're gonna score on your ADOS that's totally meaningless or you're not gonna get a good sense of their developmental skills because they're tired and they're not gonna show you anything. Um, you also have to be kind of zippy when you're doing it, so knowing the assessments really well is very important. Um, having a lot of practice or having someone there to help as you're learning that assessment so that they're, you know, kind of especially when you're seeing someone clinically, this really, really matters. Um, you can get kind of the best possible performance out of their child. Um, yeah, so I mentioned some of the things in terms of kind of stranger anxiety, separation anxiety. So you're always really, in almost all cases, in the under three crowd, you'll have the parents in the room when you're doing the assessment. There may be some cases where the kid's been in therapy and the parents like, I think they'll do better without me here, um, but they have to be there for the ADOS. But you wanna have a familiar person there usually. And if I have a child who I know is a little shyer, I'll give a really long period of kind of warming up as well, especially for the ADOS because if they're you know shy the whole time and they're scared of me the whole time, again, they're gonna be elevated on the ADOS and I don't have useful information then. Um, but if you give kind of a nice long free play period in the beginning and you cannot get in their face, like that's another thing with like the little ones, especially under two, like, I think we want to start the social interaction so quickly, but you can't do it. You have to give them some time to kind of explore the room, um, get comfortable with things, and just kind of tiptoe your way in um, so that you're not overwhelming them and they don't kind of go into their shell. So I think it's, it's really important to have had experience um, with typically developing kids, kids who are coming in kind of clinically, a range of children around this age and to just have a basic comfort level with interacting with them in any type of setting before you start trying to do that clinically because I've seen ADOSs where I think, you know, kind of people haven't perfectly excellent at the ADOS, but there's that, you know, kind of discomfort with the younger age or the lack of fluidity or just kind of not quite getting how to enter into this child, child social world. 
and you know, kind of that there's one case where there was an ADOS that was elevated. I redid it with that child because we were pretty sure that child didn't have it. Um, and he got like, he went from like a score of 10 to one in a raw score. So it was a pretty big difference. And by the end of it, he was like running over to me, lifting his belly so I can tickle him. And that was not happening the first time. And it's the same child. And um, so it's really important to be kind of thinking about these things because even more so than with older children, like you can really just not get an accurate behavior sample for that child. Um, and then you have to know how to deal with non-compliance. Like this is true across the board, but you're just gonna see more of it. Um, and so I'll just give an example here. <laughs> the nanny left the room and the kid was very separation anxious and I told her not to, but she did. So he flipped out. He's 18 months. <laughs> I may have started it too early. Did you guys just get a taste? Let's <laughs> try and pull it together. And fast and furious sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, so my strategy here was just to kind of wait him out. Like if you add more fuel to the fire, it usually doesn't add much to it. It usually doesn't help. They're not listening to reason. Um, so it might have been a little longer ADOS in the end. But, um, but yeah, so I kind of waited him out and then I waited until he pulled it together himself. And then once he started playing, I kind of lightly entered back into the interaction. He was a little shaky throughout, but I still saw some really nice social stuff despite that. Um, and then you just have to be really flexible. So like when you're doing a Mullen, which is a common developmental test that we'll do, um, you gotta be able to kind of go back and forth. You may need to, especially with our kids who are showing autism symptoms, they may not be into your silly like toy that you have. You may need to switch something out. You kind of have to test the limits to see kind of what will they do um, because there may be some early rigidity that you're seeing and stuff. Um, or you may have to be worried about letting them, you know, kind of have access to the cars um, because you know they're going to get stuck on it. And once you know that, um, that's useful clinical information and then you may try to kind of work around that or use it in some way too. So if I'm trying to hide something for an object permanence task and they're really into cars and they don't like whatever the other thing I hid was, then I might see if they'll go look for it. Because all I really care about is do they know this thing still exists when it's hidden. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. And luckily our developmental tests at these earlier ages allow for that flexibility, unlike some of the ones that kind of happen later in development. Um, so when we're thinking about differential diagnosis, um, there is, I kind of just put down some of the things that I'm kind of considering. And depending on where you're seeing kids clinically, some of these are gonna be more common than others. So if I'm in a research setting, in the research study, I'm definitely considering typical development and normal variability. In a clinical setting, that is probably less common. So by the time someone gets into a specialized clinic, there's probably at least some sort of delay or something concerning going on to make the parents kind of go through all of that trouble. You have to always consider it, but um, that may be less likely. Um, and then again, a lot of these kids coming in have language delays um, or could just be delayed across the board. It may be an early manifestation of anxiety. Um, it may be kind of like ADHD symptoms coming online or just kind of behavior problems that are coming online um, that you have to differentiate. Or again, especially if there's a family history, it may be just, okay, this is not like a full clinical presentation of autism, but there are some things, keep watching this kid, but a diagnosis doesn't, isn't appropriate at this point. Um, so we'll see if, uh, we'll do a little bit to see if you guys want to interact a bit about, around these. So if we think about, um, let's think about um, giving that kiddo who freaked out with the separation anxiety. 
Um, a kid who's more inhibited or has kind of emerging maybe social anxiety or some type of anxiety presentation versus a kid who um, has ASD. Um, which, you know, kind of, how would you in the social communication deficits area, what might be some things that you'd be paying attention to or important areas to really kind of dig into to differentiate, assuming this kiddo is not going to show you their best in an assessment setting? What might be some things that you would consider? Words across settings. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so you may dig in more with the parents or try to get other collateral um, to kind of get a sense when they are comfortable. You should still see, you know, kids may always look better when they're comfortable, but you're still seeing those deficits when they're uncomfortable or when they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. Join attention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sometimes, so this kiddo right here, so once, even though he was kind of dysregulated and anxious and all of this stuff, um, he, once his nanny entered the room and stuff and he was playing, he still found times to kind of um, share his interest with me as well. So I, you know, you can still kind of see through. Um, and there was also a child who I saw who seemed to have more of a selective mutism presentation. And um, I just looked for nonverbals more. So maybe she wasn't gonna talk with me <laughs> as much. Um, but when I just looked at her nonverbal and I was kind of not too in her face and, um, she still showed me quite a bit, maybe not as much as she could have when she was more comfortable, but um, you know, kind of you're still seeing some of the some of these skills. Um, if we think about kind of repetitive behaviors, then or other kind of symptom domain, um, let's think about let's think about if we're differentiating between global developmental delay, things like that. Um, what are some of the things you might be paying attention to? in this area, in repetitive behaviors. Actually, let's skip to anxiety. What might be some anxiety stuff? What might be a symptom that you kind of brush off a little bit with these kids or don't pay, kind of aren't as concerned about or aren't as convinced by? So I'll say kind of maybe a little bit of rigidity you would expect with anxiety, right? So if that's like a lot of what you're seeing is like they need things in a particular way, they may be on another trajectory to something else and that may be a different type of rigidity um, than you might see in um, a child with autism. Um, or it could be both too. Um, and maybe there's kind of some sensory stuff going on where if they have a lot of sensory aversions, maybe you would expect that in an anxiety profile as well. So I'm always a little bit um, hesitant if those are the main early in development, especially if those are the main areas that I'm seeing. I, you know, kind of mo more commonly actually what you see in the one and two year olds is you'll see repetitive behaviors, like a whole ton of different types of repetitive behaviors, repetitive language, repetitive motor mannerisms that are help happening more than you would expect, and um, a lot of like repetitive play and actions too. Um, that feels more kind of specific to autism for me. But if it's a global developmental delay situation, it may be kind of appropriate. If a kid's echoing what I'm saying right away in their learning language, there is an aspect that's quite typical about that, so you have to be kind of cautious in that area. All right. Um, okay, so you've kind of done everything. You have a good assessment. And providing feedback is my kind of favorite part of the assessment process, even though it's often the hard part. But this is the kind of place where you're really kind of setting the stage. And with a first diagnosis in particular, right, this is a really meaningful moment in the parents kind of experience and if you can really explain things to them and do this in an emotionally supportive and hopeful way then you're setting a really nice stage um, for the family as a whole and for that child and those parents down the road and so i unless i get the sense that parents um you know kind of don't want it aren't ready to hear much yet um i will communicate pretty clearly after like each day of testing rather than waiting making them wait those weeks, it's really hard as a parent to live in that sort of um, uncertainty. So I may not say specifically the diagnosis, but I will say things like, I am seeing autism symptoms, or some of the, the things you described do sound like autism symptoms, or you know, I'm seeing consistently, consistency between 
what you described and what I'm seeing here, um, or I just may kind of mention some of the kind of major areas that I think um, will need to be a focus of intervention as well as some of the kind of strengths that their child's showing. So I'll try to communicate with the family throughout. Um, and when you are um, kind of actually, generally my approach when I'm actually doing the feedback is within the first few minutes I'll say the diagnosis because usually when they're coming to me at least that's what the answer they're trying to quest the question they're trying to answer and that's all they're thinking about they're not hearing anything that I'm saying in most cases until I come out with a diagnosis um, so and I, I noticed with myself and earlier in my development as a clinician I think a lot of when I delay it, it's more about me being uncomfortable rather than reading the parent. Um, so it's a good thing to kind of be aware of if you're delivering a diagnosis. Um, have tissues out. There are often tears from when are both parents, not always, but there often are. It's a big, even if they wanted the diagnosis, they sought it out, they expected it. It's just a big thing to learn about their child. And often for the parents, it's a change in perception of what their child's future may look like. Um, so some of the goals for this, for this kind of meeting that I usually kind of take all the time that I need for it um, is of course to kind of describe the symptoms of autism. How do we diagnose it? Um, and how, what does it mean for their particular child? Um, how do they meet these symptoms? And you always get the question of kind of, where is my child at on the spectrum? And so usually how I'll describe that is what they want to hear is like mild, moderate, severe. Um, they don't want to hear severe usually, but you know, kind of they want to hear some kind of simple name. And I usually don't satisfy them in that way because I think there are just too many different areas. So I'll kind of describe where their child is in terms of the social communication area, in terms of the repetitive behavior area, in terms of their nonverbal skills, in terms of their verbal skills, things like that. So I'll kind of break it down a little bit more to describe their child um, more specifically because we know that you can have a high level of autism symptoms. That doesn't mean you're never going to speak. I mean, there are all of these things that kind of matter and it's not always specific to kind of one symptom domain. Um, and it's not always specific to autism either. Um, and so the other thing, you know, something you're trying to kind of really balance um, during these meetings is, you know, kind of, you want to, you don't want to leave the parent defeated, like, oh no, especially for kiddos who just didn't perform that well, whether or not it's because of a lack of skills or behavior, who knows. But, you know, kind of like, you want to make sure that they know that they're, they have enough reason for concern to go out and kind of help their child succeed, to do what they can that's within their power to help their child succeed. So you don't want to kind of downplay the things that are true needs for their child. But you also want them to be hopeful because if we're going to kind of enact change, we have to believe that change is possible and that their child can have a really meaningful, you know, kind of beautiful life and can learn new things um, regardless of where they kind of end up in adulthood. Um, so you want them to have that, you know, kind of um, that hope for the future as well. Um, so you want to leave plenty of time and kind of carry that balance throughout. Um, and then, of course, kind of instilling, you know, kind of talking about early intervention um, and how, you know, kind of often where it's just like, we don't always know that it's going to, how big of an impact it's going to have, but it's sort of like, you know, as a parent that you did what you could within the capacity of your family um, in your situation to um, give this child as many skills as possible. Um, I'll go through this quickly because we're running low on time. I want to make sure if there are questions, we can go through it. Um, so there are kind of a slew of recommendations we often um, are kind of giving to parents. Um, I think one of the important things about this is to kind of help them prioritize depending on where their child is at. So prioritize in terms of from your assessment, what might be useful treatment targets to focus on. So I saw a child recently where um, definitely has autism, I was sure of that, um, based on the evaluation. But you know, kind of with a ton of social strengths, I actually think you know, his language delay is the biggest problem that needs to be focused on. It doesn't mean that there wouldn't also be social communication in general in that um, intervention, but 
you know, kind of if this child could get more speech, and as the child gets more speech, I think they'll do really well, and that's sort of what was holding them back at the kind of the most at that point. And so kind of letting the parent know where you think is sort of the focus that they could focus on, and just also kind of having some empathy for the parent, like you're giving this big old list of things for them to do, you just gave them a new job. And it's really hard, and a lot of families have shared with me the, the challenge of um, balancing just being a parent to their child and seeing their child as this beautiful person that they love and then hearing all this stuff about what they can't do and then having to like coordinate and navigate this really complex system that is not integrated and often doesn't make it easy on the parent. They have to learn all of that. I mean, it's really overwhelming. So you wanna do what you can to help them with that and also kind of sift it out and also just call it out and give them opportunities and ways that they can get support throughout it. Um, and let them know that like it is kind of a whole process of, of learning, but also kind of emotionally um, coming to terms with, with their, their life and some changes that might be happening to, to their life in this process. Um, but yeah, often kind of for these younger kids, there's a, you know, kind of the nice thing is that there is early intervention available. So there sometimes is easier access um, for these families to some types of therapy. And luckily in California, it is often they should be able to access with an autism diagnosis, some behavioral therapy um, that we hope is useful for the children, even though it can be difficult to find the right match. Um, so you're often recommending a pretty kind of comprehensive treatment program um, and sort of guiding them through some of the kind of publicly available options as, as well as insurance based options. All right. Um, and to wrap up, there are some resources here at UCLA. So I'm starting up a group tonight, actually, um, for a parent support and education group for families who kind of most often with first diagnosis, although there could be other situations um, to help. And then we have some early intervention um, programs and Dr. Loggison's Peers for Preschoolers group for slightly older children. Um, and then we have some research studies as well. That's often something that's helpful because they might be able to get free early intervention for their kids. And you know, our kids in um, our kind of longitudinal studies, we give them feedback throughout. So there's a lot of developmental monitoring that those families are able to kind of take advantage of to get some, some help or reassurance about their child's development. Um, and then just some internet-based resources. There are lots of cool like kind of videos, there are screeners, um, there's just kind of information that you can access to, to sh for yourself or to share with families as well. All right, so low on time, but any questions <laughs> are welcome. Yeah. Can you share a little bit more about your, first of all, thank you very yeah. much. It's interesting <laughs> and informative um, lecture. The HOPE program, could you, mm -hmm. it's new, could you yeah. tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it's very much in development, and so it's a six-week parent group. Um, that's open to kind of moms and dads who have a child who's been diagnosed as on the spectrum. It's, you know, kind of, our thought is to kind of both balance emotional support for the parents, um, depending on what the needs are. It's gonna vary, I think, from group to group. Um, connecting parents with each other so that they kind of can learn from other parents and what they've been through and their knowledge um, and can kind of normalize their experience to help them toward that kind of the process of acceptance of their child's kind of diagnosis and, and their new life and what they'll be kind of working on with providing information about autism, um, about, um, you know, kind of early intervention, um, treatment, um, you know, kind of different types of treatment, regional center, IEPs, things like that. So kind of what are all the things that we would want families to know in more in depth. So kind of how I see it is like the feedback session, but being able to kind of go much more in depth with the families um, over time. Is that time limited and is there an age range for the child's diagnosis? There's not an age range um, at this point. We don't have an age range. Probably what we'll try to do as things get moving more is maybe there'll be kind of different focuses would be nice. Although I think a, a wider age range is actually kind of nice in that if you have parents who are kind of further along, they may be able to share a lot with the families that are earlier along. Um, 
I forgot the other part of your question. It is, yeah, so we're planning a six weeks so that, I mean, it, the hard thing about getting parents to come to this is they have a lot on their plate and prioritizing something that feels like it's maybe a little more for them might be hard because they just have a lot, a lot to do. And um, so we'll see how it goes in terms of, of getting families in. But yeah, we definitely want it to be time limited um, sessions for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. We, like, as a field, just know that we're better at identifying what autism looks like in males compared to females. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that might be kind of a bias in the ADOS process, like how this is a little more restricted and better behaviors, which yeah. is more females. It allows for the more social masking to occur. Would you say that the same is true for like the toddler version of ADOS? Are we better at identifying what autism looks like in a female at that age? Or yeah. Is it still kind of Heavy it's a good question, yeah. I mean, I think when um, Kathy Lord talks about it, she there are she kind of talks about there being some differences, but not always as huge as as you might expect. Um, I don't actually know. It's a good question to just look at the demographics of the kids who are included. I don't actually know. Um, that part of things. I mean, you have to pay attention to maybe different presentations of repetitive behaviors. So maybe, oh my gosh, they're playing with the baby. That's so great because they're socialized to play with babies more, but they're repetitively like putting the blanket on over and over again or something like that. So you have to kind of question some of those assumptions. Um, and maybe kind of think about them in relation to what you would expect for a little girl versus just a child in general or the boys that you've seen. Um, but I don't actually know, and there aren't different like severity scores or anything for boys versus girls. It's just based on, on age and language level. Um, so yes, yeah, so I don't think I have a good answer to that question, but it's definitely important for clinicians to be thinking about while they're um, doing their assessments, that they're thinking about typical expectations for the gender as well as um, for the age and such. Other questions? Yep. Your point about inspiring hope and acceptance on the part of family members, mm -hmm. um, given your comments, given the diagnosis and everything that you're observing, I'm asking, are there um, materials, best practices, emerging practices even, about steps that you can use to help inspire that Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I, I don't, there may be materials that I'm unaware of. I think for me, I'm just sort, it's sort of based on just experience, I guess. Um, so I think some of that is sort of developing rapport throughout so that you're a trusted person. Um, you know, kind of when you're working with a child, be really focusing on the lovely things about their child that the parents are talking about, like how they're expressing about their child um, and reflecting that you saw those things too. Like a, a child could, you know, kind of all the scores could be low and everything, but they could be like the happiest kid on the planet. They could have a temperament that's like really kind of easy to work with and you know all of these things. So paying attention to to those types of things throughout your assessment and making sure that you're highlighting those um, throughout where you're really making clear what their strengths are and what's wonderful. I usually will also kind of say like your kid's the same person they were yesterday before I gave this diagnosis and just kind of put it in perspective. Look at the report and then like don't pay attention until two years when you get a new kind of evaluation and just pay attention to your child as they are making progress day to day and really celebrate each new thing that they learn and don't be thinking about kind of what another child can do, um, which is probably helpful for all of us as parents. Um, and yeah, if you have a real genuine affection for the child and you really kind of get in touch with that, I think that that can impart on the parent and then being able to just focus on like we have evidence that early intervention is effective and I believe that your child can learn new skills. Um, and that doesn't mean I know what they're gonna look like at age 20, which they want that answer, but, and I won't give it to them, but um, you know, kind of like knowing like there is, we do have useful things to do now. Um, and you know, kind of to, to kind of inspire that action. Mm -hmm. Kind of related yeah. to that, I think it's such a great question. I do think we tend to, to pathologize a lot in our field and talk about like all the limitations and, and the negatives. And we're starting to do a little research in this area for older yeah. individuals in the spectrum, but I think it applies to this population as well as taking it what could be a negative and trying to find something positive.
positive in that as well. And a simple one I'm thinking of is um, the rigidity that you sometimes see in autism, the black and white thinking, which could look very inflexible and could be a sort of seen as a negative. You could also take that and turn that into a positive in that because they are those black and white thinkers, they're very rule driven and they tend to follow rules, they don't mm -hmm. tend to break rules. So trying to take something that could be a negative yeah. and turn it into positive, or even just focusing on strengths in mm -hmm. an assessment, I think is useful. Yeah, and I sometimes try to be like, some things are symptoms of autism and it doesn't mean they're a problem. Like, if your kid's just hand flapping on occasion, you don't need to, it's okay, it's fine. Like, at this point, he's two, like, it's not a problem. So they're not like overwhelmed with things. Or like, it's cool, like maybe they can play repetitively for a while, he enjoys it. And then when you want them to interact socially either use that or if it's too distracting put it away but like give them the flexibility to let their child kind of be their child and that they don't have to like fix the autism or undo the symptoms and more focus on like what are the things that are getting in this child's way of learning and making friends and things like that like the actual practical things and letting them let go of the idea that like the intervention is to make their child kind of normal and fit in perfectly. Like there are a lot of strengths that you may not want to wash out for them. Yeah. All right, All right. thank you guys. Thank you, Dr.